to discuss on this air pollution prevention and energy efficiency what we debated at IMO. I will invite our team members, Mr. Jaydas Gupta, President of Institute of Naval Architects, Mr. Venkat from Anglo Eastern Shipping, Mr. Devru Kabi from Indian Register of Shipping, and Mr. C. Gopi Krishna from the Directorate to kindly come on the dais and be here. So due constraint of the time, I will request if you can be a little brief in answering and be pointed because we are already running later time. So I will start with Sir K, what are the key papers India presented this time and what has been the outcome? I mean, you take a call who will decide among yourself because I know this time at IMO it was more a team effort than individual. Yeah. You no, know, the industry globally is dealing with SOX and NOx emission for a few years now. But uh, introduction of biofuels is very recent. And uh, I'm sure you all will be happy to know that India has also taken lead into this and uh, we are operating some ships on biofuels. And Indian Register Shipping, I think, has done a lot of tests and trials on biofuels. My question, next one is to this. Okay, existing ship if using blended biofuels and if the biofuels are whether B20 or B30 or less, what effect it has on NOx certification? I think there's been a lot of work on done. A lot of work has been done by uh, Mr. Kabi and so I would request Mr. Kabi to. Good evening, sirs. Uh, Actually, this question pertains to a unitized, unified interpretation protection in form of a circular. This circular was, you know, this was approved uh, last MAPC. This circular number is 795, MAPC 1795. Okay. And uh, if I deliberate on that circular, uh, it uh, divides biofuel into three, two categories. One is blend below uh, 30% and blend above 30%. Abhi, was it true that uh, B30 was... B30 is the blend uh, percentage of 30%. I mean, I mean, what I'm saying, was it told that it should be treated, uh, treated on line with fossil fuels? Sir, uh, MARPOL regulation 18, 18.3.1 and 3.2, it differentiates what is fossil and non-fossil. What is fossil fuel derived from petroleum products and 18.3.2 fossil fuel derived from non-petroleum products. So it is considered less than 30 is considered 18.3.1. This is derived from petroleum products. Yeah. This is what I said. Correct. There is some about biofuels also B30 to be treated in line with fossil fuels. Correct, sir. I think, can you also tell me that NOx certification for synthetic fuels have been adopted this time? Please also let us know what is synthetic fuel you mean by because synthetic fuel can sir, be... Sir, uh, this was a paper by Euromot. The paper number was 79.7-9, I suppose. Yep. So they, they wanted that synthetic oil to be put in line with that circular for biofuel blend till B30. It has to be similar to B30 because their contention was it is a pure form of fuel, much purer than biofuel, synthetic. How, fuel. how you think it will impact uh, India or Indian shipping in general? Uh, before that, sir, I'll just tell you what exactly is synthetic fuel that because a lot of deliberation on the definition itself. What is a synthetic fuel? fuel yeah. Okay, sir. So this is this definition that finally it was like taken from ISO standard, which is 8217-2017. There's a clear-cut definition for synthetic fuel. Uh, where they defined it, it is either it is a synthetic or renew, renewable, you know, source. It has to be from synthetic or renewable source, having properties like distillate, petroleum distillate fuel. So basically it is a petroleum distillate fuel properties, but it has to be from a renewable source. Like I can give you an example, e-diesel. E-diesel is sort of a synthetic fuel. Okay, sir. The next question, I mean, we'll come to that question now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please. 
Sir, India has presented uh, last time a paper for NOx certification of biofuels. So it was accepted that up to 30% of blend can be used, blended biofuel with fossil fuel can be used in diesel engine if there is no change in the NOx technical settings, which is there in the technical file. And there was no decision on the blends which are above 30%. So we gave a paper that above 30% blends, we gave a procedure for NOx certification of the fuel or fossil fuel with above 30% uh, biofuel. It was decided to include the same in the long-term plan of IMO to when they are going to change the NOx technical code completely to include all the alternate fuels. Now they said administration can decide. So we now have a procedure for NOx certification of blends beyond 30%. Re regarding RBFNO, it's a renewable fuel of non-biological origin. That means you have to capture carbon from air. You cannot use a, uh, 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 bio, it's not a biofuel. And in India, there are a lot of biofuel, e-fuels are being envisaged to be manufactured by, I, I met Jindal, they are going to manufacture e-fuels, e-diesels. So once these are manufactured and they are included in our NOx technical code certification, then over a period of time, our existing ships, it, it, they can act like a drop-in fuel for our existing ship, which can reduce the C, uh, carbon footprints also, and also can be used without any modification to the ship. That is the whole, uh, this thing. So there was a paper by Euromot, which said that in lines with the biofuel up to 30%, you should also accept e-fuels. E-fuels, they capture carbon from air, use some processes to manufacture from hydrogen, from electrolysis, to produce a long carbon chain, just like diesel oil. And that is all exactly is the e-fuel and it, it was accepted and UI was changed to include also e-fuel with the definition of RBFNO. That's a, it's a renewable fuel of non-biological origin. Thank you. Can you also tell me in that case, do we are required to have a multiple NOx certification on ship? No, sir. Multiple NOx certification is not required. And it's a right question. We have not placed it there, but administration can give a certificate in line with the uh, uh, regulation four, that is of alternate fuels. Thank you. Sir. Uh, I, uh, thank you, sir. Vikram, sir, thank you. Thanks for the update. Uh, but I can tell you the output of that Euromot that was actually accepted. That means you can use synthetic fuel oil in line with your B30 blend. Okay, biofuel. So this is almost, I mean, uh, that was what was decided. Yep. Yeah, anyway, thank you so much. Do you think how it is going to impact Indian shipping? Sir, uh, just uh, because I told there are manufacturers, mm -hmm. okay, they have been uh, producing e-diesel, e-methanol, e-ammonia and all that. They are mostly e-diesel, e synthetic. Availability in India? Of course. And uh, when they are started producing, and there's been mm -hmm. promised that two th by 2025, 26, the fuels will be made available, especially by Jindal. Okay, so now if this is coming into picture and this is a regulatory, uh, coming to a regulatory framework to accept mm -hmm. till 30% without NOx, you know, assessment, it will have a, a tremendous benefit. I mean, it is just like a ready to use fuel with no changes on board, no changes to any machinery or anything on existing ships. You can anyway, just, thank you, Kavi. Yeah. I will now give it to a little different topic other than biofuels about the supply of bunkers on board. For the last few years, India is among the few countries in the world. Singapore is next door to us who have some requirements and approval processes for <clears throat> bunker suppliers. This issue was also taken up this time at IMO. I, I, can you just tell me that uh, while we have adopted a licensing of bunker suppliers for years now, we propose this to be made mandatory this time at IMO. What was the reaction? So we are quite right. I think Mr. Gopi sir, <laughs> being administration, I think he can answer it. Uh, thanks for the question, sir. This uh, mandatory certification scheme, there were two papers. One paper was an information paper. Basically, that, that paper was from IBIA, uh, Bunker Association, the International Bunker Association, uh, and combined with BIMCO. So they have put up on paper. And in that paper, they have uh, given the mandatory certification, I mean, how it is going to help 
the industry they have uh, taken a survey around 189 respondents have responded to this uh, survey and these uh, groups i mean the regions i mean i'm not uh, talking about the regions i'm talking about the groups one group is about the bunker suppliers the other group is the brokers brokers who are arranging for the uh, bunkers and the bunker receivers bunker receivers means the shipping companies charters operators uh, so they, they they are known group the other group the fourth group is uh, the insurers the i mean the administration everything so these four groups are among these four groups they have made a survey around 189 respondents i mean I, as i told you already so in that survey they have taken the inputs from all the area all the area the survey was carried out somewhere in uh, february uh, february to march 2022 and they are given saying that mandatory certification system is for the bunkering is will resolve the quantity and quality disputes so therefore we welcome that paper we intervene that paper and we suggest uh, we propose that citing our own example of having a bunker uh, mandatory certification we have having a certification mandatory certification based on that we gave our inputs and then successful by that way we have achieved successful implementation of global sulfur cap we gave our experience to the international uh, i mean member states and uh, we proposed that but it was uh, they said it we will take up this in the long term as of now they have all emphasized mp mepc has emp emphasized as to take the circular mepc 1884 revision 1 so the latest revision that revision they have that is for the guidance for the member states and coastal states to for the best practice of bunkering so they have emphasized to take up the interested member states to take up the that uh, guidance and based on that uh, experience to put up papers for the future so that is what uh, present status is but that means uh, no decision was taken because i personally feel and speaking on behalf of the seafarers that an approval bunker supplier is there then the responsibility on their shoulder is minimal because there have been lot of uh, Uh, detention etc when bunkers were found below specifications and invariably it was master and chief engineer on ship which were made responsible and with that mind only i know that indian government few years ago said that the bunker supplier has to be registered so at least they can pinpoint somebody that who was the supplier so i'm not very i'm convinced that the reason why we have we have given our example as well as we have given the example of singapore as well so how it is resolving all these quality and quantity disputes so therefore we have taken up with the you know mepc and uh, we are uh, it they have said that it, it as of now let it be voluntary uh, later on uh, you know we it is it is it is it will be taking place uh, mandatory see the, the regarding the mandatory licensing from the administration means the administration also is owning up to ensure that the quality bunker is provided in this their arena because one side we are making regulations and say that this is the conditions to be done and uh, we uh, the ship owners who are visiting such ports suddenly take up some bunker and they do not know from whom exactly to be taken also so once it is taken the entire burden comes on the ship owner whether there is any defect happens and whether there is any other claims comes it again prolongs like a legal battle so that is what the objective of regarding the uh, licensing of uh, as well it is not to control somebody but at the same time it's very interesting to note that why the uh, imo the forum like imo even the if you are seeing the uh, marpol regulations also there is a registry is required only thing that the license is not uh, specified uh, exactly but the the uh, the interesting part is that majority of the uh, issues connected with the bunker uh, bad quality bunker supply has happened in some of the specific developed countries only 
so that is why they are not agreeing with the uh, zone so there are several politics connected with that but i think it has to eventually has to come and it will come right sir i just uh, add up to sir what is this? i will i'll continue paper says sir that. sir has given me the input so i will take on that no no okay. i'm only speaking on behalf of the <laughs> there were geographical regions where this poor you know bunker i mean poor quality of bunker has been noticed whether it is complaint fuel non complaint fuel non complaint means instead of 0.5 0.51 up to 0.53 it is considered as compliant if it goes beyond 0.53 then it is considered as non compliant and the geographical regions if you are taking the one of the papers one of the papers submitted by ics says that the usa i mean the developed countries like usa and europe the quality of bunker is not to the mark and there has been reported that non compliant fuel is much much more than uh southeast asia or middle east uh at the chinese or korean or japanese ports so therefore it is that is the reason uh, sir said that is the reason this proposal is not being accepted as of now so when they are complaint to this certainly this will be taken up by im also i am sure you, sir it will help the seafarers who in the past have been subjected to lot of hardships when bunkers were found below bunker particularly during psc inspections so with that in mind i think it is a good proposal and i must compliment india that we have already taken a right direction but we need to take it further at imo so my next question though i will talk more in the gsg reduction emission but i particularly wanted to know there was some agenda item about energy efficiency design index phase 4 phase 4 so what is the status or was this discussed Uh, sir there were some submissions uh, regarding the edi phase 4 but at the same time the that was kept in abeyance because the life cycle assessment guidelines are still being prepared and they will be uh, approved in mepc 80 so the uh, overall consensus was to hold this until the time the life cycle guide guidelines are completed because there were a number of submissions like for example moving forward like uh, in case of alternate fuels edi as it stands now the edi formula as it stands now is not the appropriate metric to measure the efficiency of the vessels burning alternate fuels because they don't emit co2 so keeping all those in mind that is kept in abeyance and will be taken up subsequently thank right. you so this what i understand that the proposal for phase 4 was deferred i'm i'm just adding to what mr venkat said Uh, until now the edi has been concentrating on the emission uh, of fuel from on that basis they were doing uh, edi as it is defined so energy efficiency aspect has not been addressed so there have been a number of uh, submissions and discussions on how the edi formulation should take place through different methods since it covers the entire gamut of different types of uh, fuels and uh, of different origin including e fuel synthetic fuel and the life cycle assessment of the biofuels hasn't happened so that's the basic reason why it has been postponed at least until uh, mpc 80 mpc 80 is going to be quite a, a watershed moment yeah thank you any on the same subject uh, i mean to reduce and take advantage sharp generators i mean they were in the work way back in the 1980s and 90s when even i was selling we had sharp generators but in between sharp generators were done away with but now because of this i think sharp generators are being reintroduced so what is going to be the impact of sharp generators uh, so, so, yes sir uh, has it found favor sir <laughs> sir uh, there is a there is a paper on that but actually it is not impacting any calculation as such this is just a uh, clarification that has been made by ax and it has been duly clarified that's all if you talk about sub generator but if you talk of sapoli epl that's a different question altogether no just talking about it is the sub generator is coming back into uh, be installed on ships sir 
See, the new propulsion devices are not the old type of shaft generators. They're energy produced and used by pot propulsions also. So there's a difference which is happening. So the concept of shaft generator as it happened and offtake from the energy produced, electrical energy produced, that is changing. So that's the reason why this Shapoli and uh, limitation on uh, the power limitation that, that is being addressed. It is also one of the background issues behind this. Anyway, thank you so much. Actually, we just wanted to know what is future in store for us. So another one new topic I would say is a carbon capture. So can you elaborate what is carbon capture, what it means and how we are going to achieve this? Okay. Uh, for that, I think uh, we need, this has been under discussion for quite some time and even India has come out with a policy paper on carbon capture, mainly addressing the land-based industries where it is being implemented. Now, if you're talking about carbon capture, if you see the basics of it, there are different stages. The first stage is the chemistry of it. If you burn diesel oil, then 100 kg of diesel oil produces approximately 225 kg of carbon dioxide. If you burn LNG, if it is lean, lean LNG, then 100 kg of lean LNG will produce about 250 kgs of carbon dioxide. And if you produce, if you burn rich LNG, then about 180 kgs of carbon dioxide. All this carbon dioxide, which is emitted due to the power generation process, if that can be captured, then it can be recirculated back into the system. So the term is carbon capture, utilization and sequestration. Since the entire cycle involves the carbon capture, so there's a technology part of carbon capture, which is involved. There are various processes of carbon capture, which are being investigated and the technology readiness level of the different uh, areas of uh, methods of carbon capture, they have not reached the same level. So there are, it is still under discussion. So therefore the carbon capture, although there have been submissions, there were two submissions from China. There was one submission from uh, Korea. There was a previous submission in 77, MEP 77 from Korea. And also one submission from uh, DNV. The DNV submission, uh, they suggested that we should include carbon capture right now in the CII and EXI uh, formulation. But since the carbon capture is uh, very integrated with the sequestration and utilization, we cannot allow that to happen unless the entire life cycle part of it is addressed. So therefore we uh, said that, yes, let it be there. And we shall take it up subsequently again. And uh, we agreed to the proposal of DNB to generate a work stream process for carbon capture uh, across the uh, whole, whole world. So that is the situation where it is right now. And Mr. Alkupta, this is a very interesting topic of carbon yes, yes, capture. Yes. And I think we'll have to deliberate it further yeah, yeah. for the insurance. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. I have another issue related to this exhaust gas cleaning system, discharge emission factor. I think this was also projected and presented, but not deliberated. Can anyone give reason why it was not taken up or what are the outcome? So if you uh, talk of discharge criteria, that was taken up actually. It was taken up, but it was taken up in the plenary. Okay, if you talk of that, there was two papers. One was a paper from Germany where they, uh, they want to define the discharge criteria. I mean, what conditions to take. Okay. Uh, they wanted to take the maximum you know, concentration level. Whereas uh, the other paper, they contradict those papers and they say it has to be an average concentration that you have to take for the calculation of discharge criteria. So that is where the contention was. And it was not decided. I mean, it was deferred to. Uh, the another uh, NPC, and they want now submission of papers on that. Okay, Th thank you, Kabi. Yes. So, th this issue is also then pending for the next MEPC. Correct, sir. Can I raise the last question then? This is also a little confusing to us. Boil of gas on LNG ships consumed, including gas sent to the gas consumer unit, is to be reported as fuel consumed 
in the IMO data collection system, how you react and uh, is it justified? Boil of gas to be reported. So it is already there in the regulation. Okay, what he says, it has to be reported if it is for propulsion and operational issues. Now they have defined it, what is operational issues? What they have defined, they have defined if you are using it in boilers, if you're using boil of gas in a boiler, or if you're using for tank control, pressure control, in that case also you are burning off the boil off for controlling your tanks. So that is quite, I mean, if you see the background, the correspondence group, and uh, if, I mean, 20 year flags, they accepted as it is. They say, it, if you are not considering that for the tank pressure control also, then there is no point in, I mean, that means, because this is a single glass, gas, this is a boil off. You're not using different gas or different uh, method of control. This is a single gas, single fuel, which is being used for propulsion, boiler, and for tank control. So this has to be considered. That is what no, they're If you're reporting, that means uh, it will be counted for CII? It has to be. It is decided. Yeah, I will talk in the our last one, talk about ambition, <laughs> what impact it will going to have on CII. Anyway, would you like to add anything which uh, you feel we should be informing today? I have no more, more questions as far as the presentations are made. Important thing that uh, is going to touch upon. Thank please, you. That is on, actually, industry should know about this. There's the EDI, uh, the revisions, I mean, the latest. That, the three revisions on regulation. That is the same. Yeah. Uh, this is regarding the uh, same three plants. So there were some unified uh, interpretations that were approved. So one is regarding the statement of compliance. So one is regarding the statement of compliance. So the first, the uh, regulation comes into force from 1st of November, but uh, when the statement of compliance is issued in 2023 for the 2022 IMO DCS data, then uh, that is not yet, that will not have the CII in the statement of compliance. That was one thing that is, uh, uh, I think related to regulation eight of the uh, MARPOL N6. Next is regarding the SIEM3 plan itself. And, uh, for a vessel that is delivered in a particular year, then for the, uh, it may be operated for a very short period and that may skew the CII rating for that, maybe worse off. So to avoid that kind of situations, a uh, certain window period has been given. So if the vessel is delivered uh, on or after 1st of October in that particular year, then uh, even if she is the first uh, implementation plan year is taken as the next year, subsequent to that. But if it is delivered from 1st Jan till 30th of September, then the first implementation year is the, the year of delivery. So that is one. And uh, second is in case of a vessel changing flag or changing company or both during a year, then for that vessel, when the SIEM3 plan is prepared, then the first year for the implementation plan is the year in which that has happened. And lastly, regarding the corrective action plan, like uh, how much time a company has to set the plan in place and to attain, attain the uh, required CII. So in case a vessel is uh, in a non-compliant rating in a particular year, for example, in 2023, a uh, vessel is in a non-compliant rating, then that data is verified. And in 2024, the corrective action plan will be reviewed and approved. And the vessel needs to be in a compliant rating in 2025. So if the current year, the year Y, if she's in a non-compliant rating, then in the year Y plus one, she needs to have the corrective action plan in place. And in the year Y plus two, she has to be in a compliant rating. So those were also like uh, included in the uh, unified interpretations. Yeah, thank you, Venkat. Thank you so much. Before we conclude, can I ask you one question? Last one, what do you propose to present for MEPCAT? Have you made any plan what papers you will be writing on behalf of India? Answer this. I will answer this question, sir. Already, uh, our colleague, Mr. Vikrant Rai, has already given the plan to do, you know, already has given to. As far as this air pollution prevention is concerned, we will be able to say that. So, um, we are, uh, as we have discussed, mandatory certification regarding that, uh, our experience, we are planning to put up a paper on that. And then the second one is uh, the a, a paper which we have already discussed. I mean, uh, the Japan, I mean, uh, paper, Japan, along with the Japan, they are proposing a paper for the sustainable biofuels. That is number two. 
and number 3 is uh, towards edi that is um, we are planning to propose an amendment for edi uh, uh, that will be taken care of exi as well so uh, that is a present uh, planning which we have that thank you so much thank you Thank very you. heartening to note that the work has already started and you have plans to present a couple of papers this time so wish you all the best yeah if, if i just can uh, sum up i think it it's really heartening to see the uh, efforts and initiatives taken by dg shipping uh, especially mr sukumaran uh, mr vikrant rai driving the whole thing and it's uh, see pollution prevention safety they they are all interlinked and there is a huge amount of work which is required to be carried out and uh, hearty congratulations to dg shipping and uh, the entire uh, fraternity and i hope that we shall keep this uh, momentum on with that i would like to end my submission thank you i think if the audience have any questions you please keep with you at the end of our panel discussions we'll take them on and then we we'll see if time permitting we can answer them so thank you so much sir Yakam. Uh, this boat with uh, challenging water quality. I am a part of your group only. <laughs> Anyhow, boat with challenging water quality has been defined, more or less defined. Is it really defined? If it's not defined, I heard like that. It is more or less, and that is one thing. If you are defining it, you are not in defined because turbidity TSA is very important. Now TSA is not in SDL. That is what been. So if it's not in SDL, how do you define? I mean, what is the limit of uh, TSS value? Uh, if you are defining a port to challenge water, I quality. think that's the major point. Major. Issue. I think it will be a combination of historical data which will finally come into play, along with your performance of the equipment, possibly a middle path on accepting a certain percentage that if it reaches that level would possibly come out as a solution. Yeah, that's right. Also, one more thing: the uh, I, I challenging think. water. What is for one particular equipment may not be challenging for another piece of equipment. So you have to define challenging water with respect to each equipment, which is uh, each type of equipment. I think that is one of the reasons why India is collecting data on what are the type of failures and what is it related to. probably just to make a more informed decision and sir that is exactly the reason what uh, rai sir is asking will a port be named as a challenge it cannot be named as a challenge because in the at a given port some plant may work some plant may not work however electrochlorination plant cannot claim salinity as a reason of non compliance where they took a path of not putting uh, what you call fresh water approach so salinity is no longer considered that is clarified thank you sir thank you uh thank you for your patience uh, my name is girish uh, and i have uh, with me uh, mr gopi krishna uh, we'll be just uh, briefly introducing what are the mandatory instruments which have been adopted this time at mepc 79 also we will we will cover briefly about some of the changes to the guidelines of for uh, eedi so the first item is on uh, the nx5 regulation 10 placards garbage management plants and uh, garbage record keeping so as we have uh, earlier presenters have, have mentioned we have already and this has been brought down to 100 gt the requirement for garbage record book has been brought down to 100 gt from 400 gt earlier only garbage management plan was required at 100 gt now even record book is also required 
and this is effective from uh, 1st of may 2024 and uh, there is a consequential amendment to this in case there is an accidental discharge or uh, safety related discharge of uh, a garbage uh, of vessel of uh, less than 100 gt then you then you have to write in the official logbook more than 100 gt you have to write in the uh, garbage record book so that is a consequential amendment due to the uh, change in the uh, gt and the second item is the bunger delivery note we have to give uh, the flash point value in the bunger delivery note this regulation was brought because there was there has been a lot of uh, bungers where which have been uh, found that uh, they, they are even less than 60 when when they have been tested uh, later on so in the bdn it should specify what will, what will be the fl flash point value and a margin has been kept normally 60 degrees is a requirement but a margin has been kept in case it is going above 70 then we need not uh, give the value but we need not uh, we can just mention that it is a statement can be given that it has been measured at or above 70 degree so that uh, we are sure that it will not uh, be below uh, 60. so it, it no need to determine if it is going beyond the 70 degree this also is coming into effect from 1st of may 2024 and the same uh, changes have been made in solar chapter 22 by msc 106 of course during, while discussing this a lot of other points have come up which requires uh, future work one is that uh, the the uh, low flash point fuels are not uh, actually it's not applicable to low flash point fuels because uh, the, the purpose of this regulation is for 60 degree flash point fuel and not for low flash point fuel so if you have a low flash point fuel, you don't have to, this BDN may not be sufficient to give all those data. So probably future we have to work on the BDNs for such fuels. And then uh, we also have uh, another problem that there is no definition of uh, flash point in the MARPOL, whereas SOLAS has got a definition that also has to be addressed in future. Now coming to the uh, next item is uh, MARPOL Annex 6 Appendix uh, 9 information to be submitted to the IMO ship uh, fuel oil consumption database. Here, a uh, lot of additional information is to be submitted in the database now as a result of the coming in of the CII regulations. So the, the new items which have been added are, one is applicable CII, whether it's AER based or CG disk based, that means whether it is a, a displacement, uh, dead weight based or a, uh, or a, a tonnage based. And then the attained EXI value, required annual operation CAI, then the attained annual operation CAI value before or after any correction, then the operational carbon intensity rating, A, B, C, D, and E, whichever is a rating given to the ship. These are the mandatory items to be filled up. And the other, there are certain voluntary items which have been uh, uh, introduced here. The purpose is that if you get uh, such information, if it is collected later on, we'll be able to uh, fi uh, maybe fine tune these requirements for a specific type of ship. For example, the, 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 what is to be added on voluntary basis are one is EPI. This is an energy efficiency performance index. Here it considers only the, the cargo voyages, laden voyages, and not the ballast voyages. Then CB dist, that is, uh, this is for passenger vessels where the birth, the birth is con number of birth is considered as the, uh, uh, for the purpose of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, the work and then in the case of roro ships we have got a cl distance and that is a in the case uh, that is a lane meter basically lane meter then the meters for the roro ships are uh, lane meters are to be the length of the lanes are to be uh, used in the in the D, D, in, in this uh, indicator and the e oi we already know it's already an old old indicator so any of all these are to be reported as a on a voluntary basis so this also comes into force in uh, from 1st of May 2024. And uh, but uh, here, since uh, it's coming into force on 1st of May, we have a problem that uh, we will not have the full year's information with us. So there is a, a suggestion for early implementation. So in, in, if you early implement from 1st of January 2024, you will get full year's information. So for that, administrations may decide to go for early implementation of, implementation of this requirement. Then. Uh, Next item is the uh, change of the okay the correction and the change in the IOPP certificate. This is a very minor change because uh, in um, Form B, the, the the title of Form B, some regulations are mentioned here, 18, 19, 20 onwards. 
this doesn't uh, this now it covers all the regulations which is part of the uh, 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 the this uh, item 5 earlier all these numbers were and all these regulation numbers were not mentioned in the title so now it is put in the title for clarity this also comes into force from 1st of may 2024 the reception facilities uh, the changes were made to many many of this annexes annex 1 2 4 5 and 6 mainly to address the reception facilities earlier this uh, regional reception facilities regional arrangements were accepted for small island developing uh, states now for the arctic states also this has been introduced because they may not be able to provide uh, reception facilities in all the ports you can have a, a regional arrangements so that has been added and uh, they are supposed to inform the uh, inform imo so that the, all the parties of the convention will be informed about these facilities this also comes into effect from 1st of may 2014 20, 20, 20, yeah 24 and then we have got uh, agenda item three. Uh, the the uh, of course there is a connected requirement is the guidelines for development of a regional reception facilities plan. It, it is connected with the previous one that is the uh, reception facilities. So there has been some changes made to these guidelines also to address this aspect that the Arctic states have been considered Arctic ports can be considered for the purpose of regional reception facilities. There are certain certain challenges to such in such ports are not able to provide uh, the port reception facilities in all, all seasons and uh, because of uh, icing and other 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 problems. Now, the, one of the major uh, changes uh, amendment this time is the uh, Mediterranean Sea emission control area for sulfur oxides and uh, particulate matter, because the new new uh, emission control area has been defined. And uh, it, it covers uh, the entire Mediterranean and the, the, the coast of Europe, Af Africa, and Asia, as, and defined by the coordinates. So now, with this coming into force, we'll have to follow the ICA requirements of fuel oil in this uh, Mediterranean area. Comes into force from 1st of May 2024, 20, but uh, normally we get a one year period of exemption. So the ships will have to comply with the requirements for fuel oil only from 1st of May 2025. So that was about the mandatory instruments, what has been um, adopted by this, uh, it was discussed at the working group and uh, the drafting group. There are a few items which I would like to in indicate uh, on the uh, interpretations of Annex 6, even though some of the, uh, the I mean, the energy efficiency of the group had already discussed some of the items, so we'll just go fast into that. One is... Uh, drop-in fuels okay the synthetic dropping fuels we already discussed this matter then we already have the this the, the boil of gases boil of gas is also been discussed in the previous uh, discussion uh, then reporting of required and attained eedi uh, there is a requirement to report it by the by the administration or ro to the uh, to, to imo so depending on the type of uh, the type of ship and the situation whether any major conversion has taken place or not a detailed interpretation has been prepared, so which will give you when it has to be reported. Normally, it is seven months after uh, the, the survey completion date or seven months after 1st of April 2022 if the survey has been done before that. Yeah, then um, in the statement of compliance, we already talked about that. This provider is covered in the previous session. Um, similarly, the uh, The three-year implementation plan of this SIEM part three. This also was briefly touched upon. So there are a few types of uh, few cases. Uh, like if you have a, when a vessel is delivered in 2023, supposing it is delivered after October, then uh, they don't have to consider whatever rating is coming out of that three months uh, period. Then uh, the next year will be taken as the first year. And when a ship is changing company or administration or uh, or both. Uh, after 1st of Jan 2023, a new SIEM uh, 3 will be required and the year of change will be the taken as the year in which the changes, uh, the first year will be the year in which the change has taken place. Yeah, this also we have covered in the previous uh, discussion because we, if you have got, uh, yeah, we don't have to address that. Then uh, something about the attained energy efficiency index EDI uh, guidelines. Some of the cha some changes have been made in the guidelines. The first one is uh, uh, the 2018 guidelines have been amended and adopted as the 2022 guideline. The CF value for ethane has been added as 2.927. Earlier it was not mentioned. 
and uh, there is a clarification on, on multiple load line certificates when you have multiple load line certificate is clarified that we have to go by the maximum uh, summer draft uh, corresponding to that that that, that value that dead weight has to be used but there are some if the some ships have been already been given previously received multiple edi assessment based on various uh, load lines then it will still remain valid but now onwards it will not be uh, given it will be based on the maximum summer draft and lastly uh, there has been a, a small amendment in the uh, speed power trials which is used for uh, energy efficiency design index so here the ittc international towing tank conference they are they have got a guide a recommended practice for procedures for uh, carrying out trials so these trials have been uh, they have given various versions of these um, uh, this uh, procedures which is whichever is applicable at the time of the trials will have to be followed so that's a minor clarification it has come in the guidelines i think that uh, with that we finish the uh, brief introduction thank you session can i invite our panelist mr ayan boats mr pk mishra mr rajiv nayar and mr kashyap sir i think we are running short of time again to my request p to b again brief and to the points reduction of jg emissions from ships has been one of the topics we have been discussing for last few years now and uh, i will just start to basically if you can give some little introduction about what you mean by jg emission the net zero or absolute zero or even what is your uh, uh, so um, idea about this emission targets to be set okay uh, thank you for that question uh, greenhouse gas emission it consists of co2 carbon dioxide then oxides of nitrogen and uh, ammonia ch4 there are some more gases there are total seven gases as per montreal convention which are considered as greenhouse gas but uh, for shipping it's mainly these three gases which are being considered as greenhouse gases so as of today we are just measuring the co2 we are not measuring the others that is being now covered in life cycle assessment guideline now with respect to your question about zero as net yeah i said net zero absolute zero and zero okay uh, and course, net lastly climate neutrality also net zero uh, all anthropogenic emission that means emission carbon emission co2 emission because volcanic activities did this are natural but because of human activities the greenhouse gases that are being emitted so that has to be controlled and that's the whole purpose to bring it down and make it i mean no more uh, emission of that now to stop every year the i mean world economy is emitting about 40 billion gig gigaton of co2 or so that's a, so now you have to bring it down to nothing it's not possible to do that to have nothing actually there is so much of carbon we have to remove it so when you balance what you adding and what you remove and how do you remove some of the removal is by planting trees etc deforestation you can remove and also you can have machines these machines are now being developed and we expect our children and grandchildren to have very high efficient machines which will suck out the greenhouse gases and sequester it or put it into use like you heard about the carbon capture and storage so that is net zero so net zero gives you a cushion if you say i am going to be zero emission that means you are not going to emit anything more which is almost impossible to achieve because you just can't do it so you have to keep that cushion that whatever excess i emit i suck it out and put it back into use 
or sequester it. Thank you. Yeah, anyway, coming on to the same thing before we proceed further, there have been terms which have used short term, mid term, and long term measures. So, what are those periods? I also like to know what are the targets for 2030, 2040, and 2050. I think GHG targets are subject to be revised now. Earlier it was not 2050, but now I think they want to attain zero by 2050. I mean, anyway, yeah. targets in three terms short term, mid term, and both. long. Yeah, I'll cover both. See, initial GHG strategy was adopted in 2018 by MEPC resolution 30472. And that time, if you look, vision was there and the level of ambition was there. Then candidate measures, short term, mid term and long-term measures were there. And then what will be the impact on states? And thereafter, like whatever supporting uh, activity and barriers and other things were there. So, I mean, with respect to your question with the short-term, mid-term and long-term, short-term period was, was there from 2018 to 2023. You know, for that, it was there like EDI need to be strengthened. Then after that, EXI was introduced. SIM part three was introduced, CII was introduced, and this has come, I mean, already in now first number 2022, and any survey which is happening on ship after 1st January 2023, any IPP survey, these items will be checked. As far as basically midterm is considered, midterm is from 2023 to 2020, uh, 2030. But even it has, work is already initiated on midterm, and a lot of things will be finalized by 2025 or 2026. And midterm is like, you know, upkeep of low carbon fuel or zero carbon fuel. Then markets based measures are there, like cap and trade system is there. And then reward mechanism is there. And fuel standard is there. And then capacity building, et cetera, is also as a midterm major. Long term major, if you look at it, long term again is coming out with zero carbon fuel our alternate fuel, and then all those devices by which we can reduce the emission, that is long term. And as far as level of ambition and vision is considered, you know, initial vision was there to reduce the GHG emission by end of century. And with that, if you know the Marpol and X6 chapter 4, regulation 20, it talks about goal and the initial strategy is there in the goal. And now level of ambition earlier was there like 40 percent uh, basically reduction from the 2008 level by 2030 that has been there are a lot of debate is going on to basically make it level of ambition more strengthened you know and various member state has various views and the majority views wants to basically uh, I mean, do away with emission by 2050, means net zero by 2050. But there are three basically line of thinking is there. One is like, like developing country, they are sticking to like reducing the emission by end of century. But there are one school of thought like between 2050 and end of century, but majority of member states, they want mm -hmm. to make it I mean, basically net zero by 2050. Yeah, shipping is feasible by 2050. Any intermediate target discussed this time at MEPC? Yes, the intermediate target means nothing has been finalized. Everything is in fluid, fluid state. But what is stated is 2030 targets, whatever was earlier 40%, people want to make it 50%. They want every basically reduction at every five years, you know, so that it has to be checked that we are on the same trajectory. And finally, bringing it to net zero or absolute zero by 2050. But that also has not been decided. Not been decided. Yet. No. It so is on fluid state and so. it will be decided during, I mean, there are two more sessions of ISW GHG is there. That is ISW GHG 14 and ISW GHG 15. And finally, this will, deliberation will happen in 14 and 15. And final revised strategy will be adopted in during MEPC. Uh, 80. 80 or 81, yeah. yeah. 80, MEPC 80. Yeah, as is a carbon intensity indicator, we have discussed in previous our MEPC review. So I will skip that now. I would also like to today take up what is the life cycle emission and proposal to phase that out by 2050. Life cycle emissions. Okay, Bob, uh, just to explain the concept, uh, 
today, uh, the CO2 emission from shipping is being considered on the basis of fuel burnt on the ship. I mean, when you are burning in the boiler or engine or main engine, or whatever CO2 is coming out, that is considered as the uh, CO2 emission, that's the GHG load. But it is being found that the alternative fuels, low carbon, zero carbon fuels that are eventually replaced the fossil fuel, this is not a good way of measuring the carbon footprint of a ship, uh, of a fuel. For example, hydrogen, it doesn't have any carbon. That hydrogen, if you burn it uh, in the ship, uh, there's not going to be any carbon emission. But today, nitrogen is used to produce hydrogen. And that is used using power from coal power plant or uh, oil power plant. So you are using actually fossil fuel to make hydrogen. And it has got a bigger environmental impact than the traditional diesel oil or heavy fuel oil, whatever we, we are using now. Because to, to make that hydrogen, you are using a lot of power, a lot of CO2 is going out. So this is not, the, so we have to consider the fuels carbon footprint on the basis of life cycle. That means from drilling to processing, to transporting, to burning, a full life cycle. So this is why this concept has come and this guideline is being now developed and uh, which will give us also, we are only considering CO2 emission, nothing else. Uh, for LNG ships, uh, CO2 comes out, also a lot of unburned LNG goes out into the atmosphere and, and that carbon footprint is much more than diesel and other, other fuels. So it, it has got, an, so all these the fuels will be judged better when we take it on a life cycle basis. And we, this guideline is being developed and we expect that this guideline, the first version will be adopted, finalized by MEPC-80. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Bose. I again come back to the whole thing that our emission by shipping is below 3%. Still, we have a lot of challenges to face and plan out our strategies for future. Now, I would like to know, what Mr. Vikram Thra has suggested that there was a paper presented by India this time that 5% uh, of total energy used on board ships to be from alternative sources by 2050. I mean, India submitted a paper on that. And I believe uh, this was very widely accepted and appreciated at uh, IMO. So any comment on uh, how it will take shape in future? You see the background behind this paper is that uh, the studies show you follow a S curve. Now you could have your 2050 vision, you could have 2040 vision, you could build up onto that. But our viewpoint is that you require at some stage to say, yes, are we reaching there? And that was the philosophy behind this paper that to achieve this, like 2050, we may come up with a figure of net zero tomorrow, politics or whatever may dictate that, or it may be 2060 or 2070. But whatever path is followed, you must have a check. And one of the basic checks we wanted to do was what we put across in this paper, that if we are able to achieve this, then yes, you are on the path. And then your revised ambitions are something which are achievable. And that, that is why it was also acknowledged that this is a good way because just putting some figure for 2050 and not really checking where you are five years down the line and you are like, don't follow the curve, uh, you're not going to be there. No, anyway, my compliments again to the Indian team for the proposal, which was so widely accepted. I think it has a thunderous applause also for this uh, proposal. And this is achievable and we should work on this in more details. So compliments to India. One issue which I've been talking about several of our discussions is correction factor. I believe nothing was discussed this time at uh, IMO or was it? I didn't see in any of the deliberation. I mean, correction factors, particularly ves vessels on ballast, vessel waiting at anchorages, 
and yeah uh, the cii in port itself the metric cii itself is half baked uh, so we will learn about it in 2026 uh, when there is going to be a review on that so uh, yes these corrective fact correction factors were discussed deliberated but nobody is willing to accept it just now but one positive point that came out of it is that uh, uh, we are adding some more uh, data to the IMO DCS, which will give us some, some more inputs to demonstrate that the CII needs a review and an improvement. And the metric which is being used now is not absolutely right. So at that point of time, I think all these corrective factors, everything will be addressed either through more available data or uh, change of the entire mechanism by which CII is calculated. Yeah, Kashyap, you're coming from a shipping company. And uh, as I said on this topic, I had a lot of interaction with industry at large. They say correction factor is a must, particularly for in while ships are in operation. Like I just said, waiting at ports, waiting in anchorage, your tank cleaning operation, and particularly on product tankers, every time you change cargo. I mean, consideration must be given to this factors. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, just to put a little perspective to it, uh, the entire short term measures were driven by an urgency. Uh, there is a lot, lot more to it that goes, because if you look at it, that uh, the initial strategy, which was identified, uh, identified the need for an impact assessment, which was also driven uh, abruptly. And so what you say is absolutely right. CII's, uh, Corrective facts, correction factors for uh, conditions which are beyond the control of a ship, op ship, ship, operation, ship operator have to be considered. For example, bad weather. For example, uh, I come to a port and there is a congestion in the port and I am not able to berth. Uh, but I think these were not all envisaged at the time when CIA was This is what I am saying. When we are deliberating on this at uh, IMO, I'm sure not only you, but other delegations will also take those topics. Yes, uh, but but actually nobody wanted to take it further because uh, Mr. Sukumaran had also mentioned that there is, there is some type of a gap. Okay. <coughs> yeah, just to yes. clarify, I mean, we, we were all involved. Some of us Plenty. were involved in the correspondence group when this were developed. And we knew that this is going to happen because the metrics we were using, CII, is just taking the two factors, dead weight of the vessel and how much sure. nautical mile it has sailed. And that the third factor was how much fuel it is con consumed. Because the data that IMO was collecting was only three d state data since 2019. So to measure anything, you need a baseline. So we could make a baseline with only these three parameters. We didn't have anything more. So, and then we were developing this. When this issues of bad weather and port waiting time correction factor came up, then the question was majority. Majority of the countries were asking if we exempt so much of fuel, how much exemption are we giving? How many million tons? How are we exempting too much fuel, is it going to be ultimately there is no result of CII regulation and uh, climate change is, I mean, it's still going on. So let us collect more data. Let us be more aware. And on that basis, we will have correction factors after two years. So and then everybody agreed to that, okay, trial period mm -hmm. and mind it during this time. No detention of vessels if a vessel doesn't comply. That, that, that was a, the main thing which positive, was introduced. That we are going for it. I mean, it's it's just trying. We don't know how good. But it will be work. counted for your CI rating A B C D E. It will be counted, sir. But you will not be you will not be penalized. You will have to propose how you intend to improve, uh, because till 2026, when there will be a review, like Mr. Bose said, there will be a lot of changes coming in because there is so much of gap between the CIA rating uh, presently being reviewed and what is envisaged. 
and i will just before i go further there is one more news wording came about your corridors green corridors I mean, this was again something new developed and i now know that australia and japan there is already green corridor and transportation of their bulk cargoes particularly your raw materials etc is through green corridor what is the status of that green corridor at imo okay. so uh, this concept see i will better i will suggest to you because you were there in the working group uh okay the the concept of green corridor is uh, uh the zero carbon in the in a particular sector where they could identify uh it probably they felt that it could be used in a liner service where you know you're going to bunker green fuel uh, at this point and move to another point b where again there is a green fuel available so that you can the entire voyage is considered green but there is a lot more involved in green corridor where the port itself should have activities which are green uh and uh, the concept which was identified was only for the journey part of it initially but as we the definitions come out from various angles one is whether you are going to consider the port itself port also to be green and if you are going to consider the port to be green is it going to be only the ship shore interface or including the port operations which are to be green so there is there is an expanding definition of green corridors uh so this discussion came up and uh, it was met with a little resistance because uh it should not become mandatory that a ship that is otherwise compliant with all other regulations is prevented from going there just because it is not able to burn uh, green fuel or uh it, it could be compliant with cii but again if it is using biofuels it would not be useful there though it is doing very good on the green fuel i mean on the cii rating because this concept was there so finally what happened during mepc was there was a voluntary resolution that was agreed on that uh, countries can among themselves decide and bring in a Uh, a green corridor concept, but uh, it was met with uh, resistance. But Countries even you mean just I'll add on him. Yeah. See, as an additional level of ambition, it has been by few member state. It has been stated that there has to be X number of green corridors by twenty thirty, and then it was further stated that all major sea route they should have a green corridor by twenty thirty five. and even few member has suggested that by 2040 there will be total decarbonization for the green corridors so this is also as additional level of ambition which is part of the document which will be debated this was not accepted okay. i mean apparently, resisted part, uh, apparently part developing of, countries like us cannot accept all these uh, yeah but it uh, is part of the discussion which will be deliberated i am sure indian delegation will take up suitably at mpc i, Now, I think it will go ahead on a voluntary basis but uh, as long as it doesn't bring about trade restrictions and like what mr kashyap said does not discriminate compliant ships uh, on voluntary basis there's something which would proceed further 